Great, thanks Abby. Good morning everybody um, and welcome to today's Family Arts webinar. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anna Diva and I'm the head of the Family Arts campaign. Um, and it's so great to have so many people today here today. I'm, I'm like, I'm sure like many of you just can't get my head around that I'm in my messy study talking to, you know, all, all these people. Um, so it's great to see those of you who've left your video on just so I can see some faces as well. It's always nice. Um, but it's wonderful to have everyone here and it looks like we've got a really interesting session ahead of us today. Um, I mean, it, just to kick off, I suppose it goes without saying that the past seven months have been incredibly challenging for so many parts of our lives. Um, and since March, we've obviously seen some huge changes um, in the arts sector and prolonged uncertainty about how and barriers, I suppose, to how we can continue doing our job, which is to provide exciting, creative, engaging, and um, welcoming experiences. Um, Abby, is it okay for sound? All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so, just how we continue to do that, really, whether that's thinking about for the venues who are able to reopen, how we can um, make those socially distant, and obviously for families, um, for anyone with small children, you know, the idea of getting families to sit, small people to sit still and in one place is incredibly challenging. Um, whether that's trying to reach families in new digital ways um, or finding more targeted approaches to reach um, particularly the most vulnerable families. Um, so it's, it's a complex environment and we're navigating all these challenges, but there's also, I think, a real lots of opportunities um, to find new ways of adapting our work and being quite creative about how, how we do that. Um, and I suppose just to say that the Family Arts Campaign is here to support you in, in, this, in this time. Um, we're about to release some research that we've done with Indigo, which we'll announce later today, um, about to provide some analysis on family attitudes and behaviours in terms of all these different areas of, of um, the limitations brought, brought about by COVID. And we'll be releasing more webinars like this one to explore best practice, to provide support, and also find ways to connect. Um, that's what makes us so powerful as a creative sector that we we have such great networks, but obviously that's so much harder now. So we'll continue to, to put these webinars together. Um, but today's section, we're gonna focus on sort of a retrospect, cast your minds back to that lockdown period um, where we saw lots of cultural organizations finding new and inspiring ways to reach and engage the, the most vulnerable families and the most the families most in need through physical packs and resources. Um, so as Abby said, we'll be hearing from Louise from Curious Minds and Gary from the Real Ideas organization to talk about the Arts Council funded initiative, um, Let's Create, um, with looking at particularly at the Northwest and the Southwest. Um, then we'll be hearing from Kirsty and Lou, who are from Children's Scrap Store in Bristol, to talk about their work in engaging the, most, the families most in need um, in their, in their, their work. Um, so we'll hear more about these initiatives, but we'll also we'll really focus on the key learnings, um, because I think there's a lot from that experience that we can take forward, uh, you know, that might continue to be helpful in, in terms of um, partnership building, um, developing content, and um, creating more sustainable ways, I think, to continue um, reaching reaching families who, who really need us. Um, so as Abby said, there's loads of time for questions, discussions, and we want this to be a conversation, so you're not being talked at for, for two hours. So do um, think of questions as we go along, add them to the chat box, um, and hopefully we'll be able to hear from you as well, because I'm so aware that there's so many organizations and artists and brilliant people who've done done um, activities like this. So it's, it's a real, really good opportunity to hear from you as well. Um, so to kick us off, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about the Family Arts campaign. Um, so we're, we're one of the Arts Council, uh, one of Arts Council's um, sector support organisation. We're national in our reach um, and we work across the sector 
um, to raise family engagement in arts and culture. And the things that we're trying to do is increase the amount and the range of activities that are available to families so that nobody misses out. Um, we also want to improve the quality of experience for families um, in engaging in, in culturally and in, in, in creative opportunities. And we want to get the sector to be able to reach more, more families outside of their, their um, local area. Um, so we're quite a small team, but we actually represent a larger consortium of partners and some of the, some of the organisations are on there um, who meet with us to make sure that we're, we're you know, re remaining relevant and supportive to, to libraries, to museums, to theatres and to dance organisations. So, um, so that's really that's really helpful part and to, to make sure that we're, we're doing as much as we, we can. Um, so in terms of what we what we do for the cultural sector, we focus on helping organisations become more family friendly, more and more age friendly as well. So obviously not considering just the needs of children, but the people who who are, bring them and who enable these experiences. So parents, grandparents, um, carers. Um, we also find opportunities where we can to promote uh, best practice. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of our in-person events and conferences are on pause for, for the time being. But like I said, we're trying to do more of these webinars. Um, and we also want to help you reach more families. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the moment in, in a few minutes. Um, so some things that you, you can do if you haven't done so already is look up our two standards badges. So they're the family arts standards and the age friendly standards which look at best practice guidelines in terms of what it means to be family and age friendly. And um, completely free to sign up. Um, all we ask is that um, you have a, a, a head of department or someone on your SNT who can confirm that the organisation wants to follow those. Um, and I'll, I'll send in, in the chat my email address so you can get in touch with me about those or indeed about anything about the, the campaign. Um, and before we move on to our speakers, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more, just in case for people who don't know, about um, a particular resource of ours, which is fantastic for families, um, which is a free online resource um, that brings you free and easy ways, really, to reach reach really um, diverse families um, locally and nationally. Um, And what we what we ask really, if you have any family activities resources, fantasticfamilies.com. Um, it's a site that has a huge library of listings and activities, and is visited by thousands of families each day. And this is something that we manage and we promote actively promote to families. Um, and it, that can include in person events for venues who who are opening. Um, virtual opportunities and sessions, and also any downloadable resources for families. And what we do is we tailor that activity so it reaches the, fam the families most appropriate to that event, so that including um, practical you know, things like age, age range, um, access points, running times, and you can add any images or content to really give families a flavour of what, what your event is. Um, and you can also be featured on our homepage so you can reach even more families. So it's a really good, good thing to, to do. Um, and the best thing really about Fantastic Families is it isn't just a place to list all these activities. It's also a big distribution database so that if you add your events here, um, they'll simultaneously appear on a range of other family facing partner websites like Netmums, The List and What's On Stage. Um, so you don't have to do things more than once, which might be helpful for um, teams that might have reduced capacity at the moment and to just add them, add them to fantastic families. Um, and what that does is by this combined reach and um, working with the partners that, that we're in contact with, you, there's a potential to reach 9 million families each month um, through, through fantastic families. So it's a great opportunity and it's completely free. This is what Arts Council fund us to do. So it's, yeah, just, just making sure that that you're that everyone's aware of it really um and um yeah just i'll just tell you a little bit more about it um 
So with that as well, we can we also work with the PR team to help you promote your events with press and um, and things like that. And we also work with lots of family bloggers and influencers who can help promote those events um, a little bit further. And you can also feature in our Facebook marketing campaigns and things like that that we're already running to help um, to help promote your your events and activities. Um, you can also be in our blog a newsletter that goes out to families in our social media campaigns and also by being part of fantastic for families you can um, nominate yourself for an award so we run this um, our award session each year um, and that gives you an opportunity to really shout about what what you think is great for families and we can help to promote that nationally to help give you some more profile um, and yeah, increase increase that reputation, I suppose, for, for families. So just a few reminders, reminders really. So that um, anything you have for families, you can go to fantasticfamilies.com and add it for free on there. You can, um, if you have any questions about this or any particular content, so any images or press releases or things like that, you can um, email the team here and we'll, be really happy to help promote that um, further. And I guess just, just keep up to date really and, and see what we're doing on social media, see what and everyone else is doing. It's a great place to, to learn a bit more um, yeah, about what, what, what anyone else is doing for, for families. Um, so I hope that's helpful um, just, just to know a little bit more about as they do, do get in touch if, if you do have any questions. Um, so, so that gives it, I suppose, a, a, a one one piece of the puzzle, really, of how we we can help you to reach more families. Um, but just to look ahead, we'll be releasing another webinar quite shortly about how to welcome families back into physical space. About how families are feeling about coming back, and um, so that'll be available. And also, I suppose, just to just to zip back to what we're talking about today that obviously it's great for us to have these digital means of reaching families but we're also fully aware that there is um an element of, of digital poverty you know that we have to be aware of um and think about families who might not have direct access to um devices and ways in which way you know they can easily be able to download things and that's what we're going to focus on today really um how we can reach and work with families who have, have very li limited resources at home um, and who might need 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 us need us most um, so on on that point i'm i'm going to mute myself now i think and uh hand over to gary and louise to tell us more about let's create and their approach for for engaging families but um yeah i look forward to hearing from everyone in the the discussion point Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting us to, to take part today. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Gary Futcher. I'm a programme lead for Real Ideas. We're the Arts Council's bridge organisation for the South West. Uh, and Louise Hesketh, who works for Curious Minds in the North West, is with me as well. And we're going to just talk a little bit about um, the Arts Council's Let's Create Packs uh, initiative that happened over the summer. Uh, and I think it's important probably just to reiterate what Anna said there. The, we know about digital poverty, and I think one of the first things that became really evident, uh, certainly for bridge organisations and cultural organisations, was we can probably throw up an awful lot of digital material online very, very quickly. Um, and there was definitely a response in the early days of lockdown about putting stuff online. What became clear to us as an organisation and lots of others was that, yes, there's digital poverty. So there are families where um, the only device in the house is mum's phone and there are three kids and the oldest kid gets the time on it if they're going to use it for a bit of schoolwork. So there's definitely an issue around digital poverty. But the other thing that we became aware of very, very quickly is there might be digital poverty, but there's also a kind of physical creative poverty in terms of families 
if you put up something online that says make this wonderful thing, even if you're saying making it from recycled materials that, that you might have available as a family, um, people might not have scissors or glue or pens and pencils or colouring pencils or paint or, or, or. So there's a real practical physical crafting po poverty. Um, and Let's Create was really about trying to make and bridge that particular gap. Um, so what's happened is across across the bridge organisations, and there are 10 bridge organisations nationally in England, um, each of us working in, in different regions, um, we set about in a very, very pragmatic way, and that's the key word for me today that you need to hold on to, about making a real on the grounds grassroots difference at speed to families who might need and and be grateful for those kind of creative uh, resources so we work very very quickly across those regions to work with a whole range of local regional partners um, making decisions about the packs what went into the packs who we could partner with where we could leverage in extra uh, support in kind or extra financial support um, but it was all about getting packs out on the ground. This slide really, uh, you know, I, I think most of us are probably aware of this, but um, we were looking at where those gaps are, um, particularly phase one, the pilot phase was focused on, on free school meals in particular, so to trying to access children um, who were in receipt of free school meals, um, and then just that element of trying to think about imaginative and creative lives of all children and young people, not just those who could afford that or, or had access to the good digital kit to enable that to happen. The pilot phase um, was, uh, ooh, when was this? This was back probably early May. Um, there was a micro budget of, of funding that came out to, to Bridges to work with um, organisations on the ground and very, very quickly um, to get packs out. Uh, I'll come uh, in a little while after Louise has spoken to a bit more about how we did that in the southwest, because I think the other important thing is each bridge tackled this differently. So you'll hear from Louise and I today about our particular approaches, but from working with the other bridge coordinators, everybody took a different approach. And it's probably um, best outlined by the two pictures you can see there. So the top picture with the paper bags is actually um, from Plymouth Scrap Store, uh, and I'm based in Plymouth, so I was looking after that. So that was um, our packs, which were in um, paper bags um, and had lots of wonderful scrap materials as well as um, making ideas. Whereas there's another set of boxes there, another bridge went to um, a different approach to get real quality craft materials out to slightly older age ranges um, of children so that there was a particular different focus and those focus really did vary uh, and we were delighted that we had um, the worksheet you can see there, the let's create worksheet um, which had been created by Andrea Zafarako who's the teacher of the year a couple of years ago um, and that really helped kind of create and, and develop everything together. Uh, what I'm going to do now um, that's my first little bit. I'm going to pass over to Louise at this stage, and she's going to take me through the next couple of slides. Helps if I unmute myself, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so our next phase was actually um, a more developed setting. Funding came out to each of the bridges specifically um, with the aim of delivering that number of packs. I imagine there's probably that many in each region by now. The amount of ingenuity that I've seen and the amount of, um, you know, match funding people were able to release. It's um, it's been really good and actually tapped into programmes that were already happening in local areas. Um, alongside funding support from Arts Council, we were given guidance on the bridges from a lady called Elaine Burke, who's an arts and health consultant on providing art materials for vulnerable children and young people during the pandemic. These highlighted the need to provide materials that make creating fun and attractive and easy and enjoyable, avoiding art materials which might cause further stress or trigger emotions 
um, reactions is important. And Ga as Gary was saying, making sure you've got all those things that you might not have at home, so that they had crayons and paper together. It might seem really simple, but actually something really important to think about. And that families would know, um, even if they didn't have those resources at home, that this was a complete package being given to their child. And um, the really nice thing all through this process, the people working on this project from the different bridges, we've come together every two weeks during the early stages of the programme, and um, we're now down to four to share ideas and updates, um, and really essentially sharing the joy that relatively small investments locally have made to the partnerships we've worked with, and most importantly to the children who we are here ultimately to support. Um, and supporting in each other in that way, I think, has been really helpful. So, to give our local picture in a little more detail, um, my bridge organisation is Curious Minds. Uh, we work up and down the northwest of England, from Carlisle to Sandbach and Blackpool to Rossendale. We'll probably give you a good idea of that picture. Um, as well as our work with bridge organisations, we work directly with schools, um, and we also manage one of the five national um, lottery heritage funded projects for Kick the Dust. Um, so that's happening in five areas across our region, and that's called Hope Street, um, which is a really nice heritage led project by, um, by and for and with young people. So for this project, um, in our pilot phase, we supported the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. And they were sending out 22,000 creative care um, kits all across the 10 GM boroughs. Um, we already had a member of our staff seconded to Greater Manchester Combined Authority, and they worked with key partners in each borough to develop a local distribution plan. Um, this included local authority culture and digital inclusion teams, as well as CAMS and iThrive. In most cases, um, local areas linked into their early help teams and carers networks. And I would say traditionally, this wasn't where bridge organisations are necessarily working. It's possibly not our first um, area of knowledge. Um, I would say schools and cultural organisations have traditionally been our link organisations. Um, but through local partnerships, we've really developed this. Um, some of those organisations in Manchester um, use the community and voluntary service. Um, that national network and their local community response hubs to distribute packs. Um, we were actually just one of a large number of funders in this programme, including Paul Hamlin, Trafford Housing and the local authority itself. Our next bit we did early on, we were one of nine funding partners in Rochdale and they brought together those partners to support their work um, across schools, local authorities equalities team, the youth service, 20 different organisations who managed to deliver 6,000 boxes across Rochdale. They've shared with some of us some of our feedback and I think again because we don't work directly we work often with the professionals who work with um, children and young people um, we don't often get this kind of direct response from children and young people themselves. Um, so I'd just like to share that with you because this is from a primary head teacher. The generosity of the funders is wonderful. We started to give out boxes today to those children in school, namely key worker and vulnerable children, as well as our year six children who started back last week. As one of the year six girls went home, happily clutching her box, she came over to me and said, please can you say thank you to the man who gave us these boxes? That just said it all. Our children and families will be so grateful for the generosity and thought of others. Just wanted to pass it on to you and your colleagues. So um, this is where the main activity for us actually happened. Um, our, those little X's on that screen just show where our areas were. So that's um, roughly West Cumbria, Lancashire and Moor, Lancaster and Morecambe, Blackburn with Darwin, Sefton, Wirral, Liverpool, Knowsley, Warrington, St Helens, Greater Manchester and Rochdale. Um, and we work very directly with our local cultural education partnerships and bridges all over the country bring these networks together. Um, and they usually um, have partners from schools and cultural organisations, but also additionally, possibly health, children's services, the youth service sector, and that can be voluntary and statutory youth service, um, from libraries, um, but also increasingly, and partly because of the Let's Create project, actually from CAMS from voluntary organisations who are working more directly with families or more broadly across communities. Um, Partly 
um, working with those partnerships was to do with our guidance from Arts Council, but also because we know the most effective organisations who know what's going on in these areas will be named partners within our within our LSEPs. So who will be working with? Oh, sorry. So the speech bubble has all the groups our partnerships told us they were targeting. Um, the heart shows the range of organisations whom the LSEPs built relationships with or who were inv already involved in those partnerships. You might notice schools are actually missing from that heart, um, but they were involved directly in the programmes. Um, in the Northwest, that was in the Wirral, where the LSEPs co-chaired by the deputy head of a special school, and in Blackburn and Darwin in St Helens, where the partnerships have given their boxes to children who've just started year seven, just in the last couple of weeks, um, those children having been identified by their schools as being the most in need. So, each of our partnerships, um, they um, actually created something really unique for their pack. As Gary was saying, some were able to access materials from scratch stores um, or other partners. Um, we had a lovely group in um, Liverpool. Um, the main distribution there was led by Comics Youth, who um, encouraged children and young people to draw um, and write and read and develop their own comics and news um, letters. And they actually commissioned some of the young people they work with to create bullet journals and self-help guides for teenagers. And that's who their packs were, um, were directly targeted at. Several of the partnerships took the opportunity to create their own booklets of activity linked to the arts and heritage of their towns or region, with the aim of encouraging children and their families to get to know their local cultural organisations and hopefully come and uh, meet them in real life as soon as they can. I'm just going to finish here with a comment that hopefully sums up what these packs have meant. The Head of Creative Arts at Blackburn Central High School wrote to her contact in the LSEP partnership. Please, could you pass on my thanks to Jaffa and Creative Connections? The art boxes have been so useful, especially in the current climate. The children were so excited to receive their own selection of art equipment and cannot wait to do the exciting projects inside. I'm going to set them a task to do one of the activities and then send in a photograph. So I'll forward some of the best ones on. As you know, our catchment area is one of the most deprived in the country. So for them to be provided with some wonderful supplies, as well as the capacity to make their own workstation, is fantastic. I really can't thank him enough, and I know it will make a difference in the creative thinking and making of all our children. And that's our story. Back to Gary. Thank you, Louise. Um, it's been brilliant, hasn't it, over, over the, the summer doing these and catching up with each other and seeing what all of the bridges are doing. Um, I'll, I'll take kind of a similar approach, but but what you'll see is, again, because of our context, there, there were differences in, in how we dealt with it. So um, whereas Louise talked about um, the place of um, cultural education partnerships, uh, at the stage we were at uh, in the Southwest, we went for more of a practical, straightforward approach with partners and organizations we knew could respond very, very quickly. Um, some of that was because uh, different sets and different situations because of furlough and those sorts of things were potentially in different positions. Um, we also, and you can see the areas we looked at there, we looked particularly at areas on our patch that we knew um, had significant disadvantage um, and networks in place that could get packs out quite quickly. And actually, Bristol and, and, and Kirsty, who's going to speak in a while at uh, the, the scrap store there, were probably our guiding light, to be honest, in the early stages. We knew that they'd already been doing work um, in Bristol, particularly with a school called Hare Clive uh, in, in part of Bristol, who have Room 13, which is a, a, a kind of artist organisation on site. And they were already starting to get packs out to their, their local community. We were also aware in Plymouth, um, Take Apart, who work in parts of Plymouth, were already in the process of putting packs out. And equally in Torbay, um, Play Torbay had a process for their young people with packs um, being 
ever so inventive at Plato Bay, they'd also started a process where PACs also had linked to Zoom meetings. So not only could young people uh, do work with the PACs themselves, but they could then sign up for a Zoom meeting and make along with the people who'd put the PACs together. Um, West Somerset, for example, was uh, is currently an opportunity area for the government, so a real focus of input, so we worked there. Um, so very different context, but all about that pragmatic provision of PACs very, very quickly. Um, there you can see the breakdown of the partners who were involved in those, those different areas. One of the interesting ones for me in Plymouth, um, certainly for phase one, um, which was the phase kind of around May to, to June, July, end of the school term, was we worked with Catered, who are a um, citywide Plymouth catering service. So it's, it's a catering cooperative. Most of the schools have signed up to it. They provide a lot of the school meals across the city, and they became a really handy, effective mechanism for getting the packs out to schools in that early stages, because they were already providing free school meals and um, food parcels and food packages in and through their schools. So their catering team simply came <laughs> once a week, as you can see from the picture there, um, and filled cars and vans and took them away and then distributed them to their schools. Um, so there was a real quick distribution that worked very, very uh, effectively. West Somerset, um, two very uh, different partners in some ways, so Contains Art, who are, are based in Watchet in Somerset, and Southwest Heritage Trust, um, who had a remit around um, the opportunity area for museums in schools, and so used some of their kind of support for the PACs to keep that work going. Um, so there was a real mix of approaches that was um, really pleasing to see. That's our range in, in kind of uh, the southwest across distribution. So a, a huge range. Louise showed that in her, her kind of images, really big range of groups. And I think the thing for us as an organization and a lesson for us is we, we yeah, like Louise said, we got in touch with a whole range of other organizations who can do this work as well. And our focus has been, uh, Bridge has largely been on schools um, in the past. So actually working with food banks, working with scrap stores, working with neighborhood associations, um, and being prepared as, as a, a bridge organization to be one step removed and not want to control everything was so freeing. Being able to say to uh, organizations, okay, here's a little bit of funding that might help you. What can you do with it? How can you distribute it? Who do you want to get it out to? And then allowing them the room and the space to get on with it and not have to feel a huge pressure to fill in lots and lots of application documents or, or, or grant applications or anything like that. Actually get it out and get on with it has been a real positive mantra for us. Um, a real mix of um, recipients for our bags. One of the things uh, for us, probably uh, certainly down in Plymouth, uh, and this part of the Southwest, some of the work uh, that we're, we're starting to do with forces families, um, looking at areas of need. So whilst the initial run was very much focused on preschool meals, very quickly the need has shifted and shaped. So um, Plato Bay, for example, a lot of their packs were with very young children. They used the funding we were able to give them really to look at 13 plus and those packs going forwards. Um, so there's been a real kind of uh, evolution, which has been the thing that, that has been particularly exciting, I think, uh, for, for us to watch and, and be part of. The response. The response has been really difficult from our angle to to get because we're at one step removed and we're not there on the doorstep with the recipients. And partly we didn't want it to be a case of having to go out and seek um, families and say, can we have lots of coverage and, and, and photographs of you? Actually, just get on and use the packs and enjoy using the packs. But what you find very quickly, certainly on dear old Facebook, is that a lot of those um, groups 
will present lots of information about what they've done and how they've done it and how they've gone about it. And that really, for me, just gives a bit of a flavour of the kind of feedback and the kind of ways the packs were being used. So, yes, some were out through schools, some were out through play schemes, as you can see there, and, and play days in the local community and packs given out as part of that. So, you know, that shift um, has been really, really powerful. Um, and I've got, um, as, as Louise did, I've got a, a, a quote as well, but I've got a slightly different quote. This one, for, this one comes from um, Jane Hembro, who's a board member at uh, Plymouth Scrap Store. And what I think was really powerful for us, uh, and for me in particular, was the sense in which the opportunity to get involved in the packs actually gave life to the scrap store and the people at the scrap store at a point at which things were looking really quite difficult for all sorts of reasons as, as Jane um, kind of alludes to in that quote and that has been probably the most powerful thing for us because the relationship we have now um, with, with Plymouth scrap store for example means that we are planning lots of other things and it's moved forward um, yes, we may have done some work on the packs, but those packs have taken on a life of their own. They, they've they done packs that also worked with Active Devon, so they became create and play packs because they had craft and they also had tennis balls and things in them over the summer. We're looking ahead to packs for the autumn half term. They're certainly looking at forces families. Um, they're looking at a whole range of other ways to use the packs in their organisation having packs that maybe people can pay it forward um, so that they can pay forwards, buy packs for other families and families can pick those packs up, having packs available in their scrap store for purchase as well. So a real mix and a real positive way that this kind of work um, has got legs beyond the bit of funding that Arts Council were able to put in. And the reality is um, genuinely, and I think this is this is the bit we know it's a drop in the ocean. What we did and what we were able to do in that period of time was a drop in the ocean. You know, the, the Southwest, our patch is huge. It's, it's Gloucestershire and Swindon and down to Bournemouth and across to the Isles of Scilly. And we did, we did five or six areas. Um, yes, we've got nearly 4,000 packs out and that's fantastic, but it's genuinely a drop in the ocean. So the more we can see that and get that going and keeping that going with, with people listening today and the work that's going on, the better. Um, and also that poverty is not going away. So for all the packs we've given out, that's brilliant. But that paper will have been used up. That glue will have gone. We need to find a sustainable model that enables that to continue uh, in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Gary. Right. So I think we have some time for questions um, now. Um, so please feel free to unmute yourself if you um, have a question. I've got one in my chat, um, which is, I'll just read it out. Um, so how do you manage compiling the packs um, themselves? Um, this person has um, the team is very small and the packing took ages when they um, did something um, similar and um, they say do you have do you use funding to pay others to compile the packs um, I'm interested in how a small team can upscale and provide more packs without using all of our office hours on packing bags yeah Louise. I can give you a little clue on that because I can show how one of our um, partnerships managed that and they actually managed it through a partnership so um, Basically, we're all um, local cultural education partnership has a number of people, um, some from the local authority who were already in, um, involved in emergency care packs and distribution and working directly with food banks um, and some who work very directly with families in need, um, the youth service and then um, a special school. So um, the head teacher, who's the co-chair of that LSEP, she 
did all the purchasing because she had a budget through school and we were able to send the funding team to her. She had it all delivered to um, the youth centre who have a big studio space that they normally use for dance. And on three days in one week, eight people rocked up in masks, gloves, socially distanced and packed boxes. So it's one of those occasions when you probably just need to draw on everyone you know and all your friends. And I think that, um, I say, I, I, Gary would probably say this as well, but actually within some of the partnerships, because there's a lot of organisations involved, they put a call out and people were able to come and volunteer. Even just half a day was really helpful in terms of the packing. So I think it's much easier to facilitate if you've got a partnership there with a few organisations. I'd, I'd, I'd concur with that, Louise. Um, Again, my closer experience has been Plymouth Scrap Store because that's where I'm based. Um, initially, the packs and the opportunity gave their staff um, something different to focus on while the scrap store was shut. So it, it gave kind of like work, but also they have volunteers. So they were using their volunteers to help do that process of packing. And what's kind of evolved now, I think, is They've got, uh, they've reorganised their space a little bit. So what they've got, if you like, is a space that is dedicated to PACs. Because they're now getting requests from PACs beyond us, um, they are in the position of going, this is part of our model, so we're going to work it into our structure and our system. Um, and they, they've really benefited and been grateful for the fact that actually they've been able to trial something that will lead into a little bit of an approach for the future, um, which is about how they work and how they approach that process and the reality is yeah, unfortunately the packs have got to be made up other bridge organizations did outsource that so they went direct to companies who could provide ready-made packs so some some had simply the boxes branded and put together uh, by an external company and then those were distributed so there yeah there are lots of different ways to approach it Great, thank you, Gary. Um, right, some more questions coming in. Um, so, um, could there be a central location where pack content, brackets, paper items, be pulled off for printing? Um, just uh, in terms of printing, uh, we had, uh, in, in effect, we had the, uh, the worksheet uh, what we ended up doing with most of the partners was simply sending the PDF and, and allowing them to print it as they needed, whether that was photocopying or print, you know, getting it done by printers. Distribution has been has been a an issue for us, uh, and it's also been an issue. We did some work also with um, the summer reading scheme uh, through the Arts Council to, to distribute some of the books and packs that weren't going out through libraries. And for them, you know, distributing across the Southwest, for example, wasn't going to be financially viable. So it's always ended up being really distribution going to a city or a place that can make use of the materials, um, trying to get it out to, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different places just adds cost. So we've tried to empower those who are doing the work to do their work in their space um, and not worry too much about having to pull a lot of resources in one place. Thank you. And um, this next one, I don't know whether Gary and Louise should be able to answer this, but maybe someone in the group can. Um, so Carolyn is in Orkney um, and she wants to know if there's anyone else doing similar in this location. Um, I don't know if you know um, Louise or Gary. I'm not sure. I literally had a very quick Google search while you were asking, and it turns out there's an organisation called Play Scotland, and you can actually get um, a home play pack from them. I'm not quite sure, because uh, there's a question I spotted in the chat as well about Wales, um, and I believe there's been some localised activity, um, but not um, not necessarily a full kind of countrywide organisation. And I guess the thing is, in several of our areas, we tapped into activity that was already happening. So while Arts Council England kind of brought together and funded what the bridges are doing, actually other organisations have been doing it all along. Um, but it might not be the obvious mainstream arts organisations, but possibly more play councils or um, that local area work. Great. 
Thank you, Louise. Thanks for that, mm -hmm. um, Louise. Just just to mention, really, that um, at the Family Arts Campaign, we have um, a set of regional networks um, that run throughout the country, and I'll send a link in the in the chat in a minute, just so you might be able to find um, one that's near you. But it's basically organisations come together to um, talk about the best ways to reach families. Um, I know Kirsty might talk and Lou might talk about a bit more about the one in Bristol, but there might be other ones um, that that might be helpful for some of the people here. So I'll just pop some information in the chat for everyone. Thanks, Anna. And just while we're on things in the chat and links in the chat, um, I will be um, I'll be copying and pasting everything out of the chat into a document and then going through and extracting all the links and things. And um, so we've got them for everyone. So I don't want anyone to panic trying to get things out of the chat towards the end of the uh, meeting. Don't worry. Um, well, also, um, don't worry about that. Um, right. Next question. Uh, there were some, uh, this is from Katrina, there was mention of some activities linked to interactive Zoom meetings. Um, what was the uptake on Zoom sessions? I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't have that data because that was um, that was Plato Bay and I've, I've kind of been in conversation with them. As far as I've picked up, um, those sessions with the children had been popular. Um, we at Rio had tried something similar early in lockdown. Just um, we, we did a series of what we called Future Mate Challenges, which were making activities. Um, and we launched a series of kind of catch up webinars for young people, which um, didn't really get a good response, partly, I think, because we didn't have a connection with the young people particularly. Um, you could do the, the, the challenges, but th that was probably it. The difference for Plato Bay is their packs and their support were going out to a known group of, of families and young people that they work with. Um, so generally speaking, what they were able to do, I think, was was kind of engaged because people knew them well. Uh, and I think that's that's one of those key things about that grassroots nature of that activity. Um, certainly, uh, Plato Bay had also done a series of um, kind of early evening webinars for for parents around support. Uh, and I've done a couple of those with them and they've been hugely well attended by by parents and families just getting support as they have needed it. Um, eight o'clock in the evening called Afterthought, an opportunity to sit back with a, a hot water bottle and a drink um, and get the support you needed. Slightly different, but again, was really valuable because it was hooking into a community who knew each other and wanted the support. Gary, I can actually answer that question uh, on Plato Bay's behalf. They've been doing eight Zooms a week um, and all of their Zooms have been full, but full is still quite a small group of children. Um, a lot of their Zooms have been specifically aimed at children who um, fall into the SEND um, target group. And so they kept the groups quite small in order to make them easier to manage for the groups. But I know they've been doing eight a week for quite some time now because I was talking to the guy that has to do the same soon eight times in a week. It's um, a bit challenging by the time you get to the eighth one, at least. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, right. Um, next question. Um, have the speakers managed to get meaningful feedback from the families about the pack? Um, so Gary and um, Louise, um, what they liked, didn't like, or what they need next? Um, the honest answer from me very quick. No, we haven't had direct feedback because we haven't directly been delivering the packs. The real people that matter to me are people like Kirsty, who's been doing it in Bristol, who can get that feedback direct from families um, and adjust the packs and adjust the need as, as goes on. Um, Louise, any thoughts? from area to area so it depends on who's been involved in delivering i mean rochdale we gave them some money but actually they've sent um and we didn't really have any um organization beyond that between what they were doing but actually they've sent back two pages of quotes from families from organizations um who've actually fed back their thoughts and we're starting to get that from a couple of fielders as well and i think it depends on how um how engaged the organisation is with their local partnerships. So in Blackburn with Darwin, it's particularly been feedback from schools, from teachers and children going, wow, is this really mine? Which was really nice. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, right. Um, so Megan says, how did you approach possible partner organisations about contributing to the scheme, especially in these tough times where many organisations are struggling? Did they contribute time rather than resources? Um, I can explain how we did that in the Northwest. Um, obviously, in Greater Manchester and Rochdale, we were funding partners, so we were approached by the local authorities um, and we handed over funds. Um, for the main stage of the programme, we worked out how many um, organisations we could fund um, basically so that they would have an impact rather than sending out funding piecemeal. So we funded five areas to the tune of £4,000 um, and they were able to use that money to buy the kits, um, pay for petrol, um, pay for a room hire if they needed it, a little bit of staff time. Actually, that was more about commissioning artists to do direct work in some cases. Now, all those organisations um, out of those five, four of them were able to raise more money, uh, which we were again able to match because um, the way bridges are funded, we have a certain amount of money that's called partnership investment. It's usually done as match funding on a much larger scale, um, but we were able to do much smaller scale programmes um, this time. So people were able to bring in funding from other sources. Um, and outside those five areas, we funded an additional three areas who raised £2,000 and we matched that with £2,000. So uh, there were three areas that we weren't able to deliver to who applied. We put it out as a brief because we knew, as Gary was saying, not all of our partnerships, not all of our cultural organisations were in a position uh, to be up and running. Um, we didn't want to put any pressure on them, but we knew, I mean, all the areas who applied to us had areas of high deprivation and they all knew who they were targeting. So West Cumbria was working very directly with looked after children um, and with young carers. Um, some of the areas were working with a range of services, um, ethnic minority services, food banks. Um, so that was the commonality. And we, we sent out a very simple brief with four questions. They wrote back to us. We went, right, yeah, you're doing the right thing. We know who you are. There's your funding, off you go. And so uh, quite a bit of trust, but actually they've delivered way beyond, um, you know, what we, what we would have initially thought anyway. I hope, hope that's helpful. Thanks, Louise. Uh, right, this next question, I think Gary, um, Gary you might have touched on it earlier um, in another question. Um, did the materials come from places other than scrap stores, like donations from art suppliers, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So it, depending on the, the bridge and the organisations, um, some, of, some of it was scrap store led, some of it was, was bought in from other organisations. Um, there was also the opportunity to buy um, from a range of suppliers who were willing to support the uh, the campaign. So there, there was kind of buying at cost price at that stage. We also um, had quite a lot of in-kind. So we, we came across uh, a, a printer in Cornwall who would traditionally give off cuts of paper to um, to schools, but schools were closed. So they had pallets of paper. So they gave us a huge pallet of paper um, that, that then was built into the packs and that was used in that way as well. So and that that was for packs in Plymouth and across Cornwall. Um, so a real a real mix, uh, genuinely a real mix. Thank you. Um, right, question from Alex. Um, she's not sure if um, she missed this at the beginning. Um, what was the requirement from ACE to evaluate impact? Um, totally understand Gary's point about not putting the burden of evaluation on smaller groups who are making and distributing the bags and thinking about how to manage funders' expectations on what is possible in measuring impact. I'm just looking at Louise to see if she was going to go first. <laughs> um, we, we both of us have, have independently responded in the chat, but um, fundamentally at the start, it was about um, get the packs out. That's the key thing. Um, we are uh, doing evaluation in different ways. Our, our attention has turned to, to evaluation a little bit more, but it is very light touch. It is about just being confident about the numbers of packs that have gone out, um, getting a sense of the spread of ages that they've been targeted with, the partners, and if we can, a little bit around 
um, any kind of additional funding, match funding that, that's gone towards it, other partners who have contributed. And then really where we can, some of that qualitative feedback about how the packs have been received and how they've been used. Uh, and that, that in terms of this moment in time, and I think it's a very specific moment in time, that really is, is kind of where we're at. I've sent out to all of our partners a very light touch, almost at what went well and even better if, um, and what's, what's the future uh, kind of evaluation. Yeah, I would say similar to Gary. We've um, we asked people to collect photographs as they went along, and if there were any press cuttings. Um, we also um, we asked people to write a blog, and I've had I've had two and a half back so far. Um, so it is it's just um, asking people about what their experiences were of putting together and delivering the packs, because very much as well as the impact on the children and young people, it's actually the ability of those partners to continue working together. And actually, for some of them, they were quite in the early stages of their partnership. Um, and while they had quite a strategic aim, which is what the local cultural education partnerships are mainly, they were actually for the first time to deliver a creative activity together. So the power of that partnership, actually, we think we'll see is one of the, the longer term things we'll see coming in. And I, I'm sure, pretty sure that Arts Council are going to be writing a report and putting something together because our, our colleague there has been um, asking us to report back into her. So we've just been sharing everything from tweets and photos and yeah, that kind of thing. Brilliant, thank you, um, Louise and Gary. Right, we do have a lot of questions in the chat, but we also need to make sure that we um, cover everything that we need to cover. Um, and there is another Q&A section at the end. Um, so I'm going to give us a five minute comfort break uh, to stretch your legs, get away from the screen for a few minutes, do what you need to do. I will be collecting all of these questions that are in the chat. So if you haven't had your question answered yet, don't worry. Um, I'll be making sure that I've got a list of them all to come back to later. Um, so I'm going to give us all five minutes. So back at 11.36, and you can just stay here if you want to, but you know, do give the time to go and get a drink. Um, and, um, and then we will um, kick off again with um, Lou and Kirsty. Um, so uh, thank you, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, great, fine. Um, so my name is Lou Taylor and I'm Events and Marketing Officer at Children's Craft Store. Um, so I'll be doing the slides and then Kirsty will be with our deputy CEO will be doing their Q&A. Um, so just to give you um, sort of a brief introduction, uh, we are a, a Bristol charity with a focus on reuse, art and play. Um, we've got an art shop, a scrap store, uh, we have an events program, and we also work in schools. Um, and um, a bit of background, so where we've been working uh, since the beginning of lockdown in March. Um, between March and uh, the end of the summer holidays, we compiled almost 4,500 uh, creative resource packs. Um, and we started with a donation scheme from our customers. Uh, we took on funded projects and we also worked in partnership with lots of different organizations. Um, we created packs for early years uh, to adults aged 70 and above. Um, and we, we made some really small runs of packs, so say 20. And then we did some larger projects. Um, so with one project, we made 750 identical packs. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the scale um, and the way that we were working. So as we've as we've worked in the last six months or so, um, our process has really evolved, and we've done lots of learning, and we have tried as much as is possible to feed our learning back into the way that we're working. As a scrap store, we've got sort of quite a unique uh, working environment, um, but I'm hoping that the practical considerations that we're going to talk about will be um, sort of appropriate and applicable to anybody who's creating packs in this way. Great. 
Great. So creating the, the pack for us was really a response to the unexpected situation of COVID. And we wanted to make sure that we were still being really true to our ethos and our approach to working with children and families, even though we were working in a very different format. So our starting point in some ways was, was the same. We were asking ourselves the same questions. Um, so thinking about are the materials appropriate for the children and families who will be using them? Are they safe? Are they fun? Can materials be combined in different ways to create a range of possibilities? So this, this idea of there being a choice for the recipients was really important for us. And can children incorporate their own ideas and interests? So we always talk about um, our events and experiences being, being child-led, and we wanted to transfer this uh, as much as possible to the experience of of receiving and using our creative pack. So, of course, we wanted to answer for all of those questions to be yes, but there were a few um, challenges and sort of unique considerations um, given the pack format and the fact that we were um, working w within the time of COVID. Um, so, I'm just going to go through the way that we responded to these new variables. So one big challenge for us um, was the absence of the interpersonal connection with children and families. So in person, we would, uh, if we were running a session um, in our space, we might perhaps ask children questions, we, we might show them interesting materials to get them engaged, to get them started. Um, and of course they would they would get quite a lot from the the shared environment and be inspired by other other families. So we didn't have we just didn't have the ability to engage with children and families in that way. So we had to think of a an alternative way that we could try and create that similar experience. Um, so what we did do um, was to include um, information in the pack, signposting families to online resources, but also, as we've mentioned already, with digital poverty, we included printed activities and ideas sheets just to make sure that as many people as possible could access ideas um, in whatever way they would usually do that. And another, another element that we put quite a lot of time into was presenting materials so that they looked appealing, um, so that opening the pack was a really exciting experience and would, would instantly engage the recipient and invitation to, to create and explore. So you can see here some felt that's kind of coiled up um, in an interesting way. Um, we would do lots of folding, wrapping things, wrapping one thing in another, and perhaps hiding something inside um, so that there was a surprise, and uh, making sure that there was a really lovely range of colors and textures, just so it immediately looked interesting and engaging. And we, we really didn't want to be prescriptive about um, the information that we were giving the families. Um, it was just, as I think was mentioned um, to Gary and Louise, just trying to recognize that everybody has a different starting point, a different confidence level with creativity. So just creating, um, making an opportunity for people to access at, you know, whatever their starting point is. So giving people information and, and ideas in case they need it, but also um, 
providing the possibility for things to be very open-ended and explorative. Okay. And another thing we thought about here um, in particular was safety. Um, so just making sure that the contents uh, of the pack were really appropriate for, for the groups who are going to be receiving it. Um, so things like pencil sharpeners, um have a have a blade in them so we we needed to make sure that we were um transferring that information to the partner agency who would be distributing just to make sure that they um, were going to end up with children um who, who would get the most out of them and there wouldn't be any, any dangers um and again, thinking about the size of materials, uh, but under five, as I think there's been some interest in the, in the chat. Um, so just thinking really carefully about the user experience and what's age appropriate. So another challenge for us is that the home environment is unknown to us. Um, when we are facilitating a session um, in our space, on our premises, we have a certain amount of control over how the environment is organized and um, what resources we place in the environment for the children and families who are coming along. So just like Gary and Louise mentioned, we, we didn't want to assume that households would have any particular tools or resources. Um, so we also included everything that, that would be needed for a particular activity. Um, thinking particularly about um, how children can combine resources. So glue, tape, string, sticky back, just giving children lots of possibilities to combine things in different ways because that's where the, the value happens. And also um, being careful to steer clear of materials that were um, sort of unnecessarily large or messy um, as, as advised also um, a glue stick instead of PVA to make sure um, that things could be contained and also um, like a really good box or bag that could um, be used as storage over time. Um, thinking about families being uh, inside, potentially in a small space and not wanting to create any sort of unnecess unnecessary chaos and um, worry about anything. Okay, so now coming on to uh, particular variables or considerations to do with the COVID situation um, and the scarcity of resources and um, opportunities. So families not, not really being able to go out to get new resources, also financial constraints. We wanted to include uh, resources that would provide excitement and novelty um, which we're really lucky with the scrap store that we do have lots of weird and wonderful items here. Um, providing materials in combination that can be used again and again in different ways. Um, so you can see here, um, it's a, a plastic tube. Uh, it's, it's not actually the same tube, but it could be. Um, so you can see it's been used to make a rocket, um, a little pom-pom pinger, and a rain stick. So just thinking about that play value over time um, with these resources, each time the sticky back could be peeled off and, and a child could start from scratch again. Um, and then also including suggestions as we did for how play could be extended with household items. So perhaps from the recycling box or um, a hat or a coat for a fancy dress um, to extend the play in a, an imaginary way. Um, so just really thinking about getting as much play value as possible from, from one selection of materials. And another 
challenge, which I'm sure lots of people are familiar with, is um, the the balance of childcare and home working having a new intensity um, in the last few months. So we wanted to we wanted the packs to really um, enrich the home environment rather than um, you know create stress. And so we would include materials that encourage children to be as self-directed as possible where appropriate, um, which again kind of goes back to the way that materials are packed. If they look very intriguing and, and the child wants to get involved immediately, then that perhaps removes um, the pressure on, on a, a parent or carer to, to be spending time directing ideas. Um, if they need to be working in the bed. Um, and also a uh, really clear transfer of information. So we, we included um, information on um, mental health and well-being, um, along with um, activity ideas and craft sheets. Um, and we really clearly prompted um, adults to give the amount of supervision that they felt was necessary for their child. Um, so really just just trying to um, hand over the information in the best way possible. So here is an example um, of some of the sheets that we, we included. So the first is, is our sort of standard class sheet um, formula. Um, so again, there was no pressure at all on children to, to create anything in particular. Um, it's just really making that option available in case um, children and families just need a starting point to get them going. Um, and then the second, um, second sheet is another, another sheet that we involved, which extended, aimed to extend play really. Um, and give children several ideas so that a pack would have um, application and value over time. So going on to think about the impact, we, we also have some lovely stories, um, which is really nice to kind of get back those, those stories. Sometimes when you, you're kind of handing a bag or a pack over or in bulk to a partner agency, um, you know, you're not you're not sure where it's going to end up um, and what's going to be done with it. So it's really great to have those those stories um, directly from recipients. But also worth thinking about um, the sort of indirect impact that the concept of resource packs have. And um, so a couple of things that we identified are the the connection that uh, the PAC system sort of forges between agencies and families, and um, so so giving schools and other agencies a really positive prompt to to get in touch and maintain a connection with families that they they might want to be supporting um, regularly over the long summer holidays, and then secondly. Um, as we worked with Feeding Bristol, um, so craft supplies um, were, were going in tandem with food. Um, we, we felt that having the creative resources um, together with food really helped to kind of relieve the stigma of accessing and needing to access food. Um, so that was really positive as well. So over the last six months, um, we we started very soon um, uh, into lockdown uh, developing packs, and that's really really grown um, over the last few months. So. We've been able to reach many, many different user groups. Um, 
So from under five to over 70s, uh, children with special needs and disabilities, young carers, um, young adults experiencing homelessness, children in hospital, um, so lots and lots of different groups. Um, and we started, we started small and we, we expanded as we felt com confident to do so. So as our, as our knowledge and our skills in this area expanded, um, we were able to, to reach more and more groups. Another, another way in which things have developed is the amount of partnership working that we've been, been able to do. Um, so we've been providing resources, uh, advice, designing and compiling packs um, for lots and lots of different organizations in Bristol and beyond. And that has given us um, a really unique oversight into what packs are going where, um, so really a sort of informal mapping exercise. So we were able to make sure that in our own projects, we weren't, weren't duplicating kind of focus on particular target areas and we could ensure that there was, there was a really broad range of distribution. And then another way that we've been developing um, the offer is to expand geographically because we can, we can post um, and career faculty um, to different areas and other organizations and um, so we can reach more areas in a, in a way that we wouldn't really be able to if we were, were working face to face. So finally, uh, just some tips really from, um, from our learnings over the last few months. So firstly, when um, thinking about compiling packs, uh, it's important to order ahead because the supply chain at the moment uh, has been affected by COVID and um, it's really, really important that you, you have what you need at the time you need it. So really good idea to think ahead. Secondly, if you don't already know about scrap stores, then it might be a really good time to, to head to Reusable, um, which is a database of all the nationwide scrap stores. Um, so that idea of novelty and curiosity, um, as well as abundance and, and lowering the cost of um, compiling resource packs could be enhanced by um, checking out scrap stores. Next is product project testing, which um, we we felt was really important. Um, so if you're providing resources um, and uh, an activity sheet, it's really important that it works and that families are going to to get enjoyment out of it and not stress. So we have been getting creative here at Crestor just to make sure that everything works as intended. Um, next is uh, processing before packing. So um, when doing large numbers of packs, just be aware that sometimes it's easier to, to pack um, on a smaller scale. Um, so rolling things up, um, placing things inside each other um, before actually picking and making all of the bags or boxes. Um, so just splitting those processes up. Volunteers is next. Um, so volunteers here have enabled us to reach many, many more families than we would have been able to just with our staff team. So that's been really impactful. Partnership working um, is a really, has been a really great way to reach communities that we wouldn't otherwise um, have been able to. Um, so each organization doing what they do best um, in combination. Transport, uh, it's a really good idea to make sure that whoever's coming to pick up the 20, 30, 40, 100 resource packs um, doesn't come on a bike, um, a car or a van, 
definitely advisable. And lastly, um, obtaining feedback is really important, not only for funders, but for, um, for developing our own offer and making sure that the, the quality and the value of the packs is just increasing and, and being enhanced all of the time. Okay, so I think that's, that's where I'll end and hand over to Kirsty for some questions. I guess it might be useful. I know a couple of you are, have asked specifically about undersized packs. So conveniently, the picture you can see right now is um, is a make a mess pack, which is one of the packs which were designed for undersized. It is quite a different process um, designing for undersized or older children. And typically, what you find is that the, the size of the pack changes. So for younger children, Typically, stuff becomes a bit bigger, which means your box or your bag needs to come become a bit bigger. Um, and everything that we put in an under five bag goes through a, a sort of stomping type test. So you put the thing on the floor, you jump all over it, and you see what happens. Um, just because it crashes because you've jumped on it doesn't mean to say it's necessarily bad. That if it crashes and it leaves a sharp edge or it crashes really easily there's, there's, there's just no point so there's that sort of level of testing and the the ideas became much simpler so we worked on the basis that uh, an idea sheet for an under five child needed no more than three instructions um, and preferably the instructions didn't involve a massive amount of precise cutting or gluing or so so the ideas became much simpler. And one of the really silly things you suddenly realise is if you try and put that on an A4 sheet, it, it doesn't look right visually. So you ended up with our idea sheets for under five typically being A5 rather than A4. Um, and then again, when you start looking at things for older children, uh, our work support of 13 pluses became more specific around a process normally. Um, so we maybe did some things about um, watercolours. So children would have a watercolour paper, a set of watercolours, a brush that worked appropriately with watercolours. Um, and then maybe some wax crayons and a sheet about art resist, uh, wax resisting with wax crayons. Or you'd look at decoupage and, and it was always about making sure that it wasn't just a thing. There was always a multitude of things you could do. But the cost in making packs for older children, in our experience, goes up. So um, £7.50 for a pack for a kind of five to ten year old is pretty much OK. Uh, but kind of 13 pluses, we were looking more like kind of £10, £12, depending on what we were trying to do. In all of our packs, there is a mixture of um, shop goods, so you know, bought materials and the scrap um, materials because it kind of opens up a broader range of things and ideas. Um, and I think then we've ended up making packs for other organisations just because we've got the space and now we've got the volunteers and we've got the supply chain sorted. So. Uh, a lot of the packs we've made for older children have been for another area or another organisation and they've had quite specific requirements which we've been able to fulfil. Uh, I'm now getting a bit confused about where the questions are. I'm hoping that answers to questions about older children and younger children, but if not, feel free to ask again. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, so I'm just trying to keep track of the questions that are coming in. Um, so um, let me just go here. Um, I saw that Louise and Gary have been putting in a few answers in the chat um, as we've gone along, which is great. Um, so we've had, we did have a question come in about um, intergenerational pack so um, someone is developing a pilot project with a local care home and a local brownie unit the aim is to connect different ages and to reach isolated older people 
Um, so I know there's been a few points about this in the um, in the chat, but um, just reading it out in case there's any um, any additional information we can help with. Uh, I'd imagine this is quite a challenge with keeping the distance. So we do quite a lot of intergenerational work when we're able to work with people directly. We haven't looked at packs directly for intergenerational work, but we have designed packs specifically for older people. We had some funding to do packs for over, I think they were actually only over 55. Um, and some, uh, we worked with the Alzheimer's Association to do packs that got sent out to them. Um, they're actually, it, it's more about thinking about the presentation of them. Very often the content is quite similar, but you're using a more, either a more childlike version or a more grown up version of a, of a similar resource. And when you're thinking about it, so like watercolor paints, you know, you can buy them in red tins that look very grown up or in plastic boxes, which look very childlike, but they're made by the same people. Um, but I, I think how you present the resource is what's important to make sure that it's appropriate for the older adults or the younger children. Great, thank you, Kirsty. Um, someone else, um, so we've covered young children and we've covered older um, kind of teens. Um, Victoria is asking, does anyone know of anything created specifically for babies? I know the Children's Centres in Bristol were working on things for under three, but I think they found it quite difficult without involving quite a lot of wet processes. And there is generally a bit of concern about wet processes and the stress level that they incur in a household. Um, it's quite difficult to find mark making materials which are appropriate for under threes and not potentially creating stressful situations in the household. But it does depend on what type of household your materials are going to. I'm not saying it's not appropriate for children to play with messy items. I'm just saying that in some of the families we were supporting, we were very aware that adding an additional level of stress was not going to support family dynamics. Great, thank you. Um, right, uh, so um, is funding still available through bridge organisations? Did anyone directly approach art suppliers for materials and how was that received? Funding isn't at the moment that that pot of money is, is done. What's happened is, um, again, it's southwest from from my perspective. But what what it's enabled is longevity in in the processes and the partnerships we've got. So what that's done is kind of seeded um, further investment, further match funding, which means certainly those those programs are going on um, and evolving really. Um, there's also um, been some work with uh, the Craft Council. So there's been an evolution and bridges are also starting to work a bit with the Craft Council to create um, what will be called Let's Craft Packs in, in the next phase. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of, what was the second part of that, Abby? Just get back to that. Sorry. That's all right. Um, did anyone directly approach art suppliers for materials and how was it received? From our end, um, a little bit, but if they're local and small, yes. Um, some of the larger ones, no. Um, with the heft of the Arts Council, there was some positive engagement with a couple of suppliers um, that, that, that then was kind of pushed out across the bridges. I think it's about kind of... Um, how much and scale uh, that they can get to make it worth their while, to be honest. Louise, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Yeah, we, I think actually our, our, our 
chief exec actually took a chance on contacting a supplier she'd worked with years back when she was a teacher um, and she actually wrote to them directly and said um, we have some funding to purchase from you would you be able to match that and they actually matched her 1500 pounds 50 percent uh, 50 50 so we got 3000 pounds worth of art materials that we could share out across our partnerships to start that up and i think it, it's one of those um, our fundraising officer always talks about this and she said just ask she never does any harm to ask it does depend who you ask and you know how long that takes but actually if you have got connections or areas you know about if you're able to offer some match funding that that actually might be possible um, and rochdale i saw in their feedback that prit stick had basically just given them four thousand prit sticks presumably again because someone asked and it might be if there's um a big supplier within your region or your area um, and if you're collaborating with other organizations or there's a longevity to that program I don't think there's any harm in making that approach, even just a, a little one via email to start something off. We we see all of our suppliers every time we put in a bulk order um, to support boxes going to vulnerable families. And I would say probably about 50% of our suppliers did. And one of the things which was actually most in demand in the height of lockdown was containers for putting packs in, whether that be boxes or bags. And so every time we wrote, we asked A for resources, but also to cardboard boxes, because all suppliers had lots and lots of cardboard boxes. Um, and virtually every one of them gave us, even if it was like 10, 20 cardboard boxes in the packing up, uh, and they were using it as packaging around the resources rather than kind of other bits and pieces. But I think it is really worthwhile asking. And I think because typically when you're doing packs, you are ordering in a very different style. So we went from ordering maybe, I don't know, a uh, hundred prick sticks a month to ordering a thousand prick sticks a month. Um, and so some of those organizations would have done quite well out of it. And, and they did respond. I would say like at least 50% of them responded quite positively. Thank you. Um, right. I can't see any other questions currently snap in my chat. Um, so please feel free to put them in. We've got time for more questions. Um, and I, I have been um, a lot of information. Um, even if you feel like it's a question um, you know, no one else has or you don't want to ask it, just put it in. Um, there's always someone else thinking the same thing. Um, so just while I wait for you to all put your questions in the comments, um, I'm just going to remind you that all the links, everything that is in the chat, I'm going to go through. I will um, I'll do it up so that everything's in a nice readable order. So we've got all the resources in one place and um, things like that. I see people are dropping in their own um, things that they've been working on, their own worksheets and resources, and I will share those out as well. Um, so do put them in. I will um, I'll take everything that's in the chat and sort it all out for you. Um, if you feel like I've missed your question, please do feel free to repost it in the chat. Um, because there's been a lot of comments, which is excellent. Um, so, uh, so yeah, do feel free to just repost that and I will read it out for you. There's uh, a, just a quick query there about Arts Award, which is um, quite useful. Um, I know some uh, organisations have tried to link PACs to Arts Award. Um, some of it becomes difficult in terms of the validation and then the fee and the approach you need to take. Um, it's probably better thinking about signposting to the Arts Award, uh, the digital online discover which might make it an easier ask. And partly, if I'm honest from our angle, and again, we, we look after Arts Award in the Southwest, again, the packs were about, and this, this is probably a little bit personal, but it's about not over curating the packs and not tying them down too much. Um, I think that the joy and the wonder for me was, broadly speaking, they were packs of stuff that went out and children, families, 
could engage with them on their terms rather than feeling there was a particular driven outcome for it. Um, you know, it might be a point of debate. Sorry. Um, and now, um, Shona says, do people include writing and story activities in your pack? And if so, how does that go? Yeah. We, we did a whole pack around um, kind of stories, uh, and it had a, a sort of a variety of things in it from three little cardboard boxes that could be used to make character scenarios. So you put a different a different head on four sides and then you use a split pin to attach like four different bodies and then a split pin to attach four different legs in order for children to generate characters. And then there was, um, we discovered that blank dice uh, work really well with a felt tip pen in that you can, they stay on well enough to roll to turn a blank dice into a story dice, but then they wash off really easily so you can use them again and again and again. And Lou, you're going to have to help me now. I believe there was backdrops for puppet studios and shadow puppet bits, but I'm running out of the rest of the content. So there was there were tropes in that one, so like a kind of animation, um, kind of old-fashioned animation technique. Thank you. Um, Right, next one. We've got lots of questions coming in now, which is great. Um, so Sue asks, if you're producing a design sheet or PDF, how do you avoid any copyright issues, such as um, you might have seen an idea but not know where the original came from? Because we were... Go on. Oh, sorry. Across our partnerships, um, they actually commission some cultural organisations to make activities themselves. So they've been willing to share those packs. And I put a link into the culture co-op in Lancaster and Morecambe earlier. And I actually think people, if you got in touch with them, they would be willing to share that. I think it's very much about giving credit where it's due and a, and a link across to that. And some places, including Tate, I think, actually created um, pack resources so that they can be printed out and their credit is printed on them. Thank you. Um, did you have the did you have the challenge of providing instructions for families where the parents may not speak English as their first language? Yeah. Um, we do a lot of ours very visually. So actually, the main processes would be in a picture, um, and because we were giving stuff to a third party we worked on the basis that the third party had a way of working with that family appropriately so um so our, our packs had different themes and different processes depending on who they were if a third party needed a specific change um then either we would make the change if we could before it went to them so if they were working specifically we have one group of children who works with children with um who were likely to self-harm. So they were like, we just don't want pencil sharpeners. We don't want pencils. And so we just took those things out. But if a group had a need like that, it would be, we would try and send them the stuff and then they would work with it in a manner that was appropriate. So uh, we know some of the children's centers who have families who would prefer to receive information in a different language would change it when it got to them. Um, it's very difficult to do that thing at the speed and the scale that we were trying to go at originally but the joy of the partnership is your partner organization knows the needs of their specific families and will have those support mechanisms in place already thanks Kathy. um okay sean says how are people reopening links with schools Pre-COVID, we collaborated all the time, but now we are holding off from contacting too much as they are under such pressure. I would concur with that. I think um, Bridges, I don't know if people have seen it, but the Bridges did uh, a national school survey just uh, before the end of term. So that went out in the last couple of weeks of July to get an indication 
from schools and school leaders what the landscape would be like come September. Definitely the findings at that stage were um, in terms of visits in and visits out, schools were really not looking or planning on anything much before the spring. Um, so for arts and cultural organisations, that, that might be quite a handy indication. Um, certainly what I'm picking up from school colleagues and contacts is that it's just full on. And the more we can be a bit hands off and away, uh, the better almost that they haven't got time to look at wonderful offers, however wonderful they are. Um, so I think it is treading carefully and just being aware of how really focused in on just getting on with the day to day and then being COVID secure they are being in schools at the moment. Excuse me, thank you. Um, Kirsty and Louise, are you planning on continuing to make these packs into the long term? Um, what about when you can start doing on site sessions again? Uh, we've fundamentally moved our building around quite a lot in order to produce a permanent production space because we are aware that there's going to be a need for a while. Um, so we are intending making packs on an ongoing basis. Um, we we do a variety of things for packs because of the art shop. Some of the other people locally who are producing packs would come and get resources from us. And some people, we just make the packs directly for them. And then we make packs for our own projects. And we are increasingly getting people phoning and asking whether we will make packs for them, which we're very happy to do because we can keep the costs down because of our processes of using scrap and having volunteers um, making up. So I see no reason that we would stop that anytime soon. Uh, and even when we are able to run sessions uh, in person, I think there will still be a place for them because different people are at very different stages of how they feel in terms of coming out to activities and, and not. Um, and even when we've run activities, we've often run activities and then had a take, a, a take home pack so that actually children can carry on. So Lou did some sessions in the summer in the car park and actually one of the things that was really nice about them was children could start their ideas there with the session but then they all had a box um partly because of the covid restrictions we can't easily reuse those materials so children may as well then take them home and enjoy them and carry on that journey and creation um so i think there will always be a place for packs in our organization moving forward thank you um were packs sent out in one big wave or did you send out smaller batches at a time allowing to send different things each time? Uh, we did both of those um, depending on the need of the organisation that the packs were going to. So sometimes it would be a very small number of quite bespoke packs, so maybe 20 packs. Um, they'd go in a one -er. Uh, over the summer, we were working with Feeding Bristol to ensure that children across the school had a, an activity pack once a week. So 750 packs were done every week throughout the summer holiday. Um, they went in quite big waves and had an army of volunteer drivers picking them up and taking them all over the city to various distribution points. Uh, so. It, it sort of depends. It's quite hard to store very many packs at a time. We got a very big building, um, and I think if you try doing it, you'll be quite surprised at the logistics of. We basically have been playing 3D Tetris for the last six months with um, supplies coming in, like resources coming in to go into packs, an area to produce packs, and then an area to store packs which were going um, and I think some people were really quite surprised that are we're really happy to give you 30 packs but you need to come and get them tomorrow uh, like coming and getting them in three weeks time just isn't going to function for us you can have packs in three weeks time but then I'll give these packs to somebody else because I can't store these for long enough for, for you um, and it was quite funny for us when when some of our colleagues started coming back from furloughs we had a core team of six of us throughout lockdown and then when colleagues started going back and and they would move things and it's like 
don't move anything. This is a very finely tuned process that we've got mastered. Uh, stuff comes in here, gets processed there, and goes out there, and people have to come and get it within the week, else it really does go horribly wrong. So in terms of whether things go out in waves, if you're going to put out a big wave, you need to have a big storage space. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, and another age related one. With any of the pack, has anyone put age recommendations on the credit sheet? For example, not suitable for under fives or any health and safety information? We definitely put a disclaimer on um, uh, the, the Plymouth packs after the first wave went out. And we learned quite a lot of lessons just to be clear what the pack was, that it was a crafting pack, that it would have small parts, that if necessary, it needed um, a little bit of parental supervision. Um, so we, we were very clear about that um, as it went forward. And I think that's quite important. But presumably, Kirsty will have much more about that. Uh, we tried to limit the content of packs so that it wasn't going to be a huge problem. So you don't want to give a pack to a child and go, but you can't do this and you can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. Um, we work very much on the concept of professional trust and giving packs to somebody who knew the families with a, in this pack, there's a pencil sharpener and there's some uh, paper clips, another quite small thing that children can swallow. And if that's not going to be right for all of your children, please take them out before they go. Um, I think it's quite difficult giving a child something that is going to be complicated in that way. So we try to think really hard about the resources, like Lou was saying earlier on, so that that could be really minimized. There were some points, um, you know, scissors are a classic, in that one of the things it's quite good to do is try cutting the things you're gonna to have to cut with the scissors that you're giving children. It's really easy as an adult to pick up a bit of card and pick up a pair of adult scissors and cut out the circle and go, yeah, that's fine. But then if you try with the same card, cutting with the scissors that you're actually going to give children, which will not be as sharp or as long, um, if it's frustrating or difficult in any shape, way or form, it just potentially adds another layer of complication to that family's experience that day. Um, so one of the things that weirdly worked quite well in our favour is we had a couple of younger volunteers who were happy to, to try things and we had some volunteers who were really crafty who came up with brilliant ideas but then we'd give one of those ideas to one of the volunteers who was less crafty and see if they could replicate it because if you can't replicate it as an adult following the instructions a child doesn't stand a chance and you don't know when you're giving packs whether that child is going to have any adult support or supervision in using it. So you need to be quite careful. One of the other things that came up for us was about balloons. Um, uh, balloons have a lot of play value in them. Uh, it's quite hard to do too much damage to the inside of a house. I want to put bouncy balls in all of the packs because I think bouncy balls are great. And my colleagues kept on telling me you can't put bouncy balls in because bouncy balls will bounce around a flat and actually will do a lot of damage. And so then, yes, okay, so what else can you do those things with? Well, a balloon is quite hard to do damage with. But if you ping a balloon or, or you can tie a balloon around, it's, so you do really need to think about it. We had some packs where we were putting in um, a tool, which is a colourful fabric, uh, like netting fabric, which we use all the time. And that particular third party was really concerned about ligatures. And so all the tool had to be cut down so you can actually use it as a ligature. Um, so it's about knowing where your packs are going and therefore how much you need to write versus how much you need to give verbally, I would say. Um, and we opted for, if, we, if it definitely had to go, we wrote it, but trying to minimize those implications um, but then verbally giving everybody that information because they are the ones, the, the people who give packs to, were the people who are going to know their families better than us making assumptions. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, right, we are, um, we've only got one minute left. Um, so I'm just having a look through. Um, if we can answer anything very quickly. Um, I think this one's 
kind of been covered in a few different places, kind of a little bit at a time. Um, Fiona says, now that schools are back open, are people now changing their approach to involve schools in the process as well? A lot of our work pre-lockdown was based on going into schools and hosting workshops, so we're looking for ways we can continue to work with schools remotely. Has anyone done any work combining a pack with a Zoom tutorial? And on the link, but I can try and share it with um, Abby afterwards that I know that um, I think Blackburn with Darwin LSEP have actually done a series of YouTube videos um, aimed at teenagers, I think, um, as part of their creative packs. Um, so they've shared theirs. On the kind of teachers in school note, we've actually done um, we've done some CPD sessions over the summer. And one thing that was suggested by a teacher was that they would be very happy to welcome artists into their classroom uh, via Zoom on a whiteboard. So actually um, an artist delivering digitally um, actually as an alternative to coming into school at the moment. And that was something that lots of people seem to think was a good idea. And I think that's possibly a relationship between an organisation and a school um, to develop how you might do that. But I think it is possible to deliver a workshop virtually in that way. Might involve a lot more work and planning, but I think it's doable. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Louise. Right. Um, I need to call this session to a close um, because it is 12.30. Um, but thank you so much to um, our four speakers, um, Gary, Louise, Lou and Kirsty. Um, you have shared so much valuable information today and um, answered so many questions. Um, so just thank you so much. It's been really great to you talk. Um, Anna, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add. Um, before we um, before we sign all off, your your thanks really. Thanks to all the speakers and thank you so much for all the everyone who's attended and has been so. This this chat has been amazing to mm -hmm. you know see all the questions, but also also these brilliant resources everyone has. And yeah. um, I've just popped in there, but if anyone wants to thinks of anything later and wants to send me um, a resource to share with people, then you know very happy to do that. Or we can continue you know talking about this on twitter i've put the details in there if people think they want to share things more widely um but but yeah thank you all so much and um yeah for such informative and, and really inspiring um projects so yeah it's been great thank you